Strategy and management games are usually played on computers. They rely heavily on menus with lots of text and numbers. Players navigate through them, using a mouse and sometimes keyboard shortcuts to make things faster. This makes them unpractical to be played with a gamepad, and even less on small screens. In this devlog, we're gonna see how I design Lure to be played with a gamepad, handheld consoles, and maybe even more. You might want to watch my first devlog to understand what my game is all about and how it works. But in short, Lure is a survival builder game. It's a very simple one where you build a city and fight against darkness. It mixes strategy with arcade gameplay. You can wishlist Lua on Steam, link in the description. Let's get into it. Strategy games often use a lot of different parameters and systems. This is usually what makes them very fun for some players, but it's a lot of work to expose, to explain, and give a way to interact with those parameters. Most strategy and management games almost look like software you would use to work more than play. There have been a lot of strategy games on consoles over time, but it always was less popular than on PC, and always a bit clunky to control. Some modern games adapted the user interface as well as controls and gameplay to be playable on handheld console, especially since the Steam Deck release. But you can see it has been adapted afterwards and not designed for it, even though some games are making very good work about it. As we've seen, the main reason behind strategy games being hard to control is because they are usually complex. The first way to make sure our game can be played with a gamepad is to make sure it does not have too much mechanics and systems. As you know, I want to keep Lua very minimal, so that should not be a problem for me. In Lua, you actually have only one game mechanic. You can change the state of a square. That's all. I know it sounds a bit abstract, but what I mean is that you can only build, change, or destroy something that's on a square. There's really not much more to it. For example, my exploration game mechanic is just changing the state of invisible squares to visible squares. You have only four different resources and very few buildings. You can gain or lose resources and your buildings can produce and consume them. There is also a simple adjacency bonus mechanic. For example, a sawmill will produce more materials the more forests around it. While it is very simple, you can already create some fun dynamics with it. But we'll talk more about that in another episode, so be sure to be subscribed if you want to watch it. In game design, we often talk about the three C. Controls, camera, character. In the strategy games on PC, you usually don't really have a character. You use the mouse to move through the screen, to press buttons, to select buildings or units and such. The mouse is sort of the character, and that's why most adaptations to console let you control a small cursor, just like the mouse. But with the gamepad, it's really not that great to control, especially in a continuous space. It's imprecise and you can feel lost pretty quickly if the map is too big and it takes a long time to move around. That's why having a discrete 2D grid as my game space is great for this. For example, in Fire Emblem, while the small screen was still a big problem, it was really easy to control. Your character is this white cursor and you just move from square to square, as simple as that. The maps are small, so you don't have any problems navigating through it. Inspired by that, Lua also has small maps, especially in the beginning, when only a few squares are available until you explore the map more. You can use the direction pad or the analog stick to move around a right cursor. If you hold the direction, it keeps moving so you don't have to press it again and again. It even goes a little faster since it usually means you want to go somewhere far. In a game for small screens and gamepads, you want to have as few menus as possible. The best thing you can do is using diegetic elements. The idea is to convey the information directly in your game world and not with a user interface. Here's an example from Lua. The light bridge is a structure that can generate light from time to time, and the player can collect it. Instead of using an icon, 
I made it very clear that there is light erupting from the bridge. Of course, it's gonna be hard to expose everything this way, and you might still need some user interfaces. You should think about the design of your user interface just like you would for a more classic game with a character, like in a fighting or platformer game for example. Resources are shown at the top, just like health bars in other games. Same thing for Quest, which is just some short texts on the side of the screen. To build something in most building games, you must first open the building menu. Choose a building among all of the buildings available, which can be very overwhelming for a first-time player. And you usually have a small pop-up with a description of the building its cost, its name, and other information. Once chosen, you place the building somewhere in the world. Taking into account that some buildings can only be placed on specific spots, while some other can be placed anywhere, but can be stronger depending on the location. I choose to do it the other way around in Lure, to make it easier to play. First, you go to the square you want to build on. Then you open the action wheel, which is the only menu in the whole game. It is used to build as well as to do anything else you need, like chopping a forest, collect light, we do not. Finally, you choose the building among a specific list tailored for this square. The game only proposes buildings that are interesting to build here. For example, a windmill is completely useless if not nearby a wheat field. So it won't propose it unless there is a width field nearby the square you selected. The effects of this building are shown at the top with the resources and not in another window. There is no description, just a very simple three to four words sentence. There are of course some drawbacks. It can be pretty easy to miss a new building, for example. I've added a few things to limit this problem. You can see the whole list of actions available when you open the menu so you can see if there is a new action you've never seen before. Also, new wear buildings are always shown first in the action wheel, to be sure you see them. But another problem is that the list is never the same, so you always need to look at it and can't really build muscle memory. It's a whole subject in itself, and if you want me to make a devlog in more detail about the user interface in my game and how it evolved over time, let me know in the comments. Lastly, be sure that text and icons are big enough to be read on a small screen. I have to say that making the first version of Lure in a 64x64 resolution really helped me to find interesting ways to have as little menus and texts as possible. Just look how much space text takes in this resolution. Gamepad controllers have their own advantages over the keyboard and mouse, and most notably, are way more comfortable and easier to use. Just look at the number of keys on your keyboard and compare this to a gamepad. And it will become pretty clear which one is easier to approach. It's almost impossible not to indicate which button does what in a game played with a keyboard. While with a gamepad, you can expect the player to just try every button and understand. For example, the zoom action won't be shown to the player in Lua, since it's not really important but I expect them to find it by themselves while playing around. The two sticks and triggers also offer analogic input that you can't replicate with only one mouse, which is very useful to control the speed of a character or a car, for example. So here's your gamepad layout. The D-pad and left stick move the cursor, move in the menus. The right stick zoom in or zoom out. The A button is to open the action wheel to validate an action or to shoot in some minigames. The B button is to close the action wheel. The Y button is to skip to the next day. And finally, the start button opens the pause menu. As you can see, I kept the number of buttons to a minimum. I would like to give every button a wall in the future though. I think it's only natural when you have a game controller that something happens when you press a button. If you have ideas what the other buttons could do, let me know in the comments. If you got this far in the video, thank you. The first devlog got a way bigger success than I expected, and I am very grateful. I hope you like this one and that we keep doing it. If you can't wait for the next devlog, 
here's a sample of what you can get by supporting me on Coffee. I make more videos every week to share my progress and talk a little bit more about my game developer life in a more intimate way. The link is in the description. See you there.